Hello, I'm Maria Williams with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Che enjoys bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnership calls and webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's Che Partnership webinar, which is titled Emerging Issues in Oil and Gas Production, Data Gaps, Policy Challenges, and Novel Threats to Health. Our moderator today is Karen Wang, Director of Che. We will leave time following the presentations for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentations. After the presentations, our moderator will read out questions for our panelists to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. For those of you who called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 45 minutes and is being recorded for our call-in webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Karen. Great, thanks, Maria. Um, especially as the Trump administration's presidency has brought a flurry of changes to U.S. environmental policy, um, including changes to oil and gas policy, Che is really excited to bring to you guys two speakers to talk about emerging issues in the oil, gas, and environmental public health arena. Our first speaker is Dr. Dr. Seth Shankoff, who is the Executive Director of the Energy and Policy Institute, PSC Healthy Energy. Dr. Shankoff is also a visiting scholar in the Department of Environmental Science, Policy and Management at UC Berkeley, an affiliate in the Environment Energy Technology Division at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in Berkeley, California. Our second speaker is Dr. Samantha Rubright, who is a manager of communications and partnerships for Frack Tracker Alliance, a nonprofit she helped to launch. Frack Tracker Alliance's mission is to study, map, and communicate the risks of oil and gas development to protect the planet and support the renewable energy transformation. With that, we'll go to our first speaker, um, Dr. Shankoff. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, to Che and, and everyone else uh, who made this possible for Sam and I to get on today and give you this presentation. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick this off and, and talk about um, an emerging trend uh, that is uh, happening in the, mostly the Western states uh, currently, but, but um, is being heavily discussed of uh, expanding to, to other places throughout the United States. And that is the reuse of oil field and oil and gas wastewater um, for uh, various purposes, including agricultural irrigation, recharge of uh, aquifers, um, and in some cases, even uh, a, a novel drinking water source. So just to um, let you all know uh, where I sit. Um, so I'm, again, the executive director of uh, the Energy Science and Policy Institute, PSC Healthy Energy. We're a group of physicians, scientists, and engineers, hence PSC, uh, who bring scientific transparency to energy policy issues. Uh, in some ways, we function like a university shop in that we identify uh, data gaps, especially ones that are impeding uh, uh, policy movement, and we fill them. We publish in the peer-reviewed literature. Um, but then unlike a university shop, we spend a good amount of effort translating science into forms that can be easily integrated into the platforms of policymakers uh, and groups working with policymakers uh, to ensure that we um, move in more responsible directions with our energy policy. So California is the third largest oil producing state in the nation. Um, uh, actually, it's the fourth as of a few weeks ago. Now, New Mexico is having a shale party and they're, um, they're now number three, but we're a, we're a, close, a close number four. Um, and the majority of oil and gas is produced in two regions in California, the San Joaquin Valley and in Los Angeles or the Los Angeles Basin. Um, as you can see from this figure um, on the green part of this, uh, 
of these these bar these uh, excuse me these these charts. Um, the darker fraction is oil that is produced without the use of hydraulic fracturing, while the lighter green fraction, the smaller fraction, is uh, oil that is produced with the use of hydraulic fracturing. And the same trend um, is there for, for gas production as well in the state. Um, and I'm going to come back to, to why this is important um, throughout my talk. Um, but just so everyone is on the same page about the resource that we're talking about, in California, only about 20% of oil production is enabled by the use of hydraulic fracturing, and the rest is enabled by the use of enhanced oil recovery and other methods. So uh, California's oil and gas fields uh, produce on average more than 10 times as much water as oil. There's often a joke in the oil industry that they're in the water business and sometimes they get oil. Um, and the, wa the wastewater that comes up with the oil is produced, um, well, it contains naturally occurring and added chemicals. Um, and wastewater from oil and gas is uh, currently reused um, for a variety of purposes in California. Um, first of all, the majority of where this reuse occurs um, is in the San Joaquin Valley or the Central Valley, uh, which is um, the, the area that is also dominated by agriculture um, and provides about 70% of the fruits and vegetables um, consumed throughout the United States. Um, the two primary ways that oil filled wastewater is uh, reused um, uh, is through aquifer recharge um, and the irrigation of food crops. And in one water district in the San Joaquin Valley, the Coelho Water District, this practice has been occurring for about 20 years. Um, and the treatment prior to application on food crops uh, is usually in the form of oil water separation and then running the produced water through walnut shells. And then usually, um, but not always, um, a blending with other water sources. So uh, as we know, drought is, is a thing. Um, not just in California, but uh, in many other places, in particular in the West, uh, in the United States. And access to water and affordable water is something that is of high priority. Um, that said, uh, it's important for us to watch out for um, potential exposure pathways through, uh, um, for example, the um, the consumption of food irrigated with water that may contain uh, compounds that that could uh, be uptaken into the edible portion of the crop, um, as well as occupational hazards of those who are who are working in fields um, where where contamination uh, could be introduced through uh, novel reuse scenarios uh, with various water supplies. And the industry for a long time um, uh, started, you know. Uh, saying that yes, we are we are sending a fraction of our produced water, our oil filled wastewater, to irrigate food crops. But don't worry, we don't hydraulically fracture the fields that are providing that produced water. And so there's no reason to worry about chemical risks from hydraulic fracturing chemicals. So some colleagues and I decided um, to look deeper at this. Um, we had just finished um, a very large independent scientific study commissioned by uh, or legislated by the state of California, um, which was focused on hydraulic fracturing. And what we noticed was that there was one database in the state, actually one database perhaps in the world, that had a mandatory disclosure mechanism for chemicals used in oil and gas production outside of hydraulic fracturing. And what we found was very interesting. Um, we found, and again, this is, or I didn't actually say this, this data set is from the South Coast Air Quality Management District, which is predominantly in the Los Angeles basin. And oil and gas production there, we found, uh, was using uh, chemicals throughout the entire process, um, including hydraulic fracturing, um, but also in routine activities such as well drilling and routine maintenance, which is captured under all acidizing in this figure. We also found that uh, there's great overlap between those chemicals used in hydraulic fracturing and in these routine activities that, again, would have to be 
uh, undertaken in any oil and gas uh, development scenario. And what we found was surprising, um, or maybe not surprising. Um, they, it was essentially the same as what we found when we looked at hydraulic fracturing chemicals in the state. And we found that, um, you know, at the, at the very base, if you're trying to conduct a chemical risk assessment, you need three main pieces of information. You need a lot more information than this, but at the core, you need these pieces of information. You need to know what the chemical is, so the unique CAS RN. Um, you need to know its toxicity, you need to know how much of it is used. And for um, over 50% of the compounds disclosed as used routinely uh, in the South Coast Air Quality Management District, um, we didn't have that information. So we started asking the question, well, now that we know that chemical use is rife throughout the oil and gas development process and not specific to hydraulic fracturing, let's look specifically at the oil and gas fields that are used, that are, that are sending their produced water for agricultural irrigation to see if there are some chemical additives that we should or should not be concerned about. Um, I, just for um, disclosure, I sit on a uh, food safety expert panel convened by the Central Valley Water Board in California, and anything that I say during this presentation uh, should be construed as my own ideas and not necessarily reflective of uh, the opinions of other panel members or the state. Um, but my colleagues and I, um, Dr. Stringfellow and, and uh, Mr. Doman, got together and asked the water board to disclose, to, to put out a mandatory disclosure policy um, to the oil operators providing produced water for agricultural irrigation. And they did that under authority of the California Water Code. Um, and um, these were all oil fields that are steam injected, not hydraulically fractured. And um, they said, hey, what are you using? And seven operators, um, you can see them right here on the slide, uh, got back and said, um, in the five oil fields that we send produced water for irrigation from, um, uh, these are the chemicals that we used. And so um, before I get to the numbers um, of chemicals, this is, we, we put all these chemicals through um, a screening process. We looked at their chemical toxicity, we looked at their carcinogenicity and mutagenicity, um, their biodegradability and bioconcentration factors. Um, so, you know, again, uh, in fields that are not being hydraulically fractured, um, five fields in the, in the Southern San Joaquin Valley, um, it was disclosed at the time that there were about 173 unique chemicals just uh, used over a two year period. Um, uh, the unfortunate part was that about almost 40% of those chemicals were um, disclosed without a unique chemical ID or a CAS RN, which meant that we didn't know what they were and so we couldn't carry them through any more analysis. But we did have 107 compounds or about 60% that we could put through this screening. Um, we, um, just to cut to the chase, um, in the interest of time, I'm happy to answer more questions during Q&A, um, we identified that eight of these compounds were on the California Prop 65 list, which are chemicals known to the state of California to cause uh, cancer and other reproductive harm. Uh, eight of them were on the US EPA National Primary Drinking Water Standard and Health Advisory uh, list. Um, 10 of them are known human carcinogens or suspected human carcinogens um, according to uh, IARC. Um, and we found that very few of them were, had, had acute mammalian toxicity, um, but about 40 of them, a good proportion of them, um, were acutely ecotoxic, meaning if they made their way into surface water um, or elsewhere, uh, they could pose um, acute toxicity hazards to, um, a, to aquatic, uh, aquatic life. And the synthesis of all of this um, is uh, about 35% of the compounds that we could look at 
um, were, you know, what we, I probably shouldn't say non-hazardous, but of limited hazard, you know, uh, for example, guar gum, um, you all have that in your ice cream, most of, most of your ice cream. Um, and it's from a bean, um, and we're not too concerned about people being exposed to that. Um, but about 27% or 46 of the compounds uh, were potential chemicals of concern that uh, are requiring uh, greater scrutiny. And then um, also very notably, about 40% of the compounds that we looked at were trade secrets. So, you know, the reuse of, of water um, in general is not a bad thing. Um, I, I think most of us believe uh, that in, especially in arid environments, uh, using water once and disposing of it is, is not sustainable. Um, and the state of California has been reusing municipal wastewater, um, AKA sewage for a, a very long time. Um, and we have a long, a, a big body of regulations called Title 22, which, which rules and regulates um, how, um, where, why, et cetera, um, water can be reused and to what treatment standard. Unfortunately, we don't have that in, for oil field wastewater. And so for the time being, we are flying a bit blind. Um, so some take home messages. Um, OPW uh, stands for oil produced water. Um, uh, it can meet drinking water standards um, uh, and uh, maximum contaminant levels and still pose health and environmental risks. And this is, this is key. It's a lot of messaging right now uh, coming from proponents of the reuse practice that say, oh, it meets drinking water standards, which are you know, essentially salinity, um, some heavy metals, um, et cetera. And so um, if it meets that, then it's good enough to irrigate crops with. But most drinking water standards don't deal with um, strange uh, chemical additives, for example, used in oil production. Um, and that deserves greater scrutiny. Uh, chemical risks are not specific to hydraulic fracturing. Um, uh, and that is probably the case throughout the entire country. So um, when we talk about uh, chemical risk in oil and gas development, that's what we should talk about, not just hydraulic fracturing. Um, and uh, again, oil and gas fields are very dynamic systems. Oil field produced water is extremely variable, both between and within oil fields. You're not gonna get the same quality uh, twice uh, each time you monitor, um, which poses uh, real challenges to being able to develop standards for, for reuse. Um, and lastly, um, uh, significant knowledge gaps persist in this area. Chemical composition of oil field produced water is relatively uncharacterized. Uh, the disclosure of chemical use in oil and gas development is, um, except for in one part of California, is, is generally not done. Um, environmental and health profiles of oil field produced water is also uncharacterized due to um, uncertainty in the chemical composition. Uh, appropriate monitoring approaches and associated limits of detection um, that are that are appropriate for the chemicals that we know are involved uh, are is is also um, only in, in its infancy and, and not quite ready to roll. Um, and uh, until we understand the chemical composition of oil produced water, um, appropriate treatment approaches for oil field produced water um, um, are are going to be. Uh, uh, also in their infancy. And um, I want to thank you all for your time. I'm looking forward to any questions. Um, and I will now pass it over to Sam. Great. Thanks, Seth. Okay. Can everybody see uh, my PowerPoint now? Yeah, it looks great, Sam. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So uh, good afternoon, and to reiterate what Seth said, I'm very honored to have been selected for this and excited to share with you the work that we've been doing at Frack Tracker. Um, so first, I guess I'd give you a little bit of background about the organization and where we're coming at from this on, on this issue. Um, in 2009, people with concerns about um, 
what they what is now called fracking um, unconventional oil and gas drilling in southwestern Pennsylvania. Uh, they started calling into an outreach center at uh, the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health, where I and a few other researchers were working at the time. Um, but you know, without good data, we're not really able to answer their questions with any degree of certainty. Um, at the time, Pennsylvania released no publicly accessible data on where the wells were drilled uh, or where violations had been issued by the state. Uh, so naturally, we started FrackTracker.org in 2010 as a way to track the industry in Pennsylvania. Uh, we, we were mapping it and trying to follow some of the trends going on with it. And then in 2012, under the direction of our current director, we spun it off into a nonprofit now called FrackTracker Alliance. Um, as previously mentioned, um, Frack Tracker's mission is to study, map, and communicate the risks of oil and gas development and its entanglements with the petrochemical industry. We do this in order to provide communities near oil and gas infrastructure with tools to make informed decisions about their future. And now for the challenge at hand, the topic today, uh, the Falcon Ethane Pipeline. For those who don't reside in southwest Pennsylvania, the proposed Falcon Pipeline will carry more than 107,000 barrels of ethane per day to feed Shell's ethane cracker plant under construction. Uh, ethane is a byproduct of natural gas extraction. It comes out in significant quantities in southwestern PA, for example. Um, Shell will then take the ethane and convert it into ethylene for making plastics. Once operational, Shell's cracker plant will be one of the largest sources of volatile organic compounds um, re released into the air in the state. And these are just some photographs of the current site where uh, they're going to be constructing the plant and a similar site in China. The Falcon Ethane Pipeline, one second, I'm going to go back here. Uh, the pipeline will cross through about 25 municipalities in three states. And Frack Tracker really believes people living in those communities deserve an opportunity to participate in shaping the pipeline's development. Uh, these projects have significant environmental, social, and public health implications. The problem, however, is that uh, pipeline projects are really complex. Uh, public comment periods are often very short. Shell submitted permit applications to the state for water crossings and erosion control for the Falcon Pipeline in September 2017 and the 30-day public comment period began on January 20th for residents in Pennsylvania. Permit applications can run many thousands of pages and require extensive time to understand their contents. Meanwhile, the scope of how risks and impacts are addressed in permit applications can be very limited, especially when pipelines are not required to undergo a full environmental impact assessment. And that's actually the case with the Falcon because it will carry ethane, not natural gas. Um, in terms of regulation, the Federal Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration inspects pipelines transporting natural gas and hazardous liquids in interstate commerce. The regulation or enforcement of standard safety practices for the transportation of natural gas liquids is actually outside of the scope of the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection's permitting authority. Uh, neither the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission nor the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, have jurisdiction over this particular uh, pipeline. And one of the unfortunate aspects of how pipelines come into being is that in many instances, communities don't realize that they'll be impacted by a project until after pipeline operators have acquired the eas easements they need uh, for the right of way and the construction plans are well underway. While concerned citizens can stitch together paper maps provided by companies in their permit applications as shown on this screen, um, that process is extremely complex and obviously very labor intensive. Pipelines have become the new front line in fights against oil and gas extraction. And this is because it's not just about the pipeline. Uh, the building pipelines have, um, has the implication for locking regions into long-term dependencies on the oil and gas industry. In Pennsylvania, for example, uh, 4,600 miles of new pipelines are already proposed for the state. Um, this figure could increase to 30,000 miles by 2040. And when you look at that quantitatively, the size of the land impacts would actually exceed that of the state park system. 
And presently, there are just over 11,000 unconventional oil and gas wells in Pennsylvania, and approximately 40,000 more would be needed to meet a demand for that infrastructure. So all of this kind of comes together to demonstrate how important it is that people concerned about these issues stay up to speed, but also how hard it is to do without good data. In uh, December of 2016, uh, FractTracker discovered a vast archive of publicly visible GIS or mappable data pertaining to the Falcon pipeline. Uh, we just Googled it. <laughs> we spent a year manually extracting the data from the open server and working with communities to identify, we, we then worked with a bunch of communities to identify what questions uh, community members had in, in asking from this data. Over that time, we collectively identified five topical questions of greatest concerns through four workshops. Uh, firstly, what is the pipeline route and what properties did Shell need to acquire? And not just the general route, but the, the actual exact route that they would be using. Where were the water crossings? What was the Falcon's proximity to buildings and recreational spaces? What's the blast zone? And what populated areas are most at risk? And also what sensitive habitats and species of concern could be impacted? And so uh, the Frack Tracker Falcon Public EIA or Environmental Impact Assessment Project was born. We released it publicly in January of 2018 when the public comment period opened in Pennsylvania. We actually organized the project along the themes identified in the data workshops and that's really helped people connect with the information we're providing. This project represents the first time residents have had access to the exact location of a proposed pipeline and its potential impacts so far in advance of permitting approval. Our project includes contextual articles um, assessing the data, as well as dynamic and clickable maps like the one you see on your screen. And needless to say, uh, the project gained a lot of media attention. Of course, the important question that um, the advocacy community has asked is why should the public only get 30 days to comment on a project that's been three years in the making? The original deadline for public comment about the Falcon's water permits was February 20th of this year. But concerned citizen groups um, used our project and associated media coverage to push the PA Department of Environmental Protection to extend the public comment period to April 17th and hold public meetings at um, beginning in April in areas that would be impacted by the pipeline. So here are just a few of our findings, um, but to give you some background, um, ethane is flammable at a lower concentration in the air than methane, slightly lower. Uh, at standard temperature and pressure, ethane is colorless and an odorless gas. And ethane pipelines are not required to be odorized, odorized like some natural gas pipelines, so you wouldn't be able to smell it if it were leaking. Preliminary analysis of this really massive collection of data, um, among various other data sources that we tapped, uh, showed that 97.5 miles of pipeline are proposed to be built through 22 townships in West Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. We found the Falcon will intersect 319 streams, 174 wetlands, with hundreds more that would be near the construction areas. We also looked at how closely the pipeline would be built to certain structures. If built, the potential risk area, or uh, 660 feet, that's the standard, would encompass a number of residences, businesses, and other items um, as I've listed on this slide. And I provide this group of statistics in particular because pipelines can pose significant public health risks. Uh, for instance, a 2016 natural gas pipeline accident in Pennsylvania, um, which was caused by corroded welding, it leveled a house 200 feet away and another house 800 feet away, sustained major damage, and its occupant received third degree burns while sitting in his living room. So the 660 feet um, potential risk area is very accurate, uh, very relevant there. And this incident um, isn't unique. According to federal data, there have been more than 4,200 pipeline incidents nationwide since 2010 resulting in 100 fatalities, at least 470 inju injuries, and property damage exceeding $3.4 billion. So all of this comes to say is people within the risk area of the Falcon pipeline should be well aware of the location of the pipeline and what's at stake. 
Um, some of the specific issues we identified in the data have also had some really tangible impacts. Uh, for example, on this slide, um, you can see we found in our anal uh, watershed analysis that the falcon will disturb headwater streams of the Ambridge Reservoir. Uh, the reservoir supplies 6.5 million gallons of water a day to 30,000 customers in nine townships. So it's a pretty significant uh, customer base. And when the information about where the pipeline would be crossing um, was brought to the attention of the Ambridge Water Authority, they released a statement uh, to the public and the DEP um, talking about trying to get it routed outside of the, the watershed. While researching communities that would be within range of the Falcon's blast zone, which is technically 990 feet, we discovered the pipeline would run straight through a new luxury housing development. Um, the houses aren't yet built, they're, they're in the process. And there are real consequences um, in choosing to build new developments in close proximity to a pipeline. This is actually seen last year. Um, residents in a similar development in Firestone, Colorado, woke up to a pipeline explosion in their backyards that killed two people. We passed this proximity information along to investigative reporters in the Pittsburgh area, and they learned that the developer signed uh, agreements with Shell, sectioned off parcels for new houses, and nobody told homeowners about the pending pipeline. Um, these homeowners are now organizing to determine what actions they might take against the uh, housing developer and Shell, underscoring the importance of making oil and gas development information accessible and understandable in a timely manner. So overall, um, our work and this project especially, they're meant to foster deeper long-term engagements with regulatory processes. It's not designed to, to be a stop um, portion. You know, we're not trying to stop the conversation here. But uh, we really see a great need for improved transparency in the oil and gas space, especially with regard to data. Pipeline data shouldn't be something that a nonprofit combs through for a year and to provide to the public. Transparency is a, a process, not a singular event, and the public health community stands to gain greatly with improvements in industry and regulatory transparency. The resources we provide are meant to expand public dialogue about what should be included in assessing the risks of large-scale development projects that have broad applications, broad implications for public and environmental health. And finally, they also serve as models for how data transparency ought to be enabled by regulatory agencies when helping the public to understand the implications of the oil and gas industry. The Falcon EIA maps and articles we developed are crucial tools, but I would be remiss in not acknowledging the many groups of people with whom we collaborated to make this data transparency opportunity a reality, especially the Clean Air Council and the Breathe Project. Um, if you'd like to know more, all of the information that I've discussed today and more can be found on our website at fracktracker.org. And we'll update our site as the proposed Falcon pipeline is considered uh, moving forward. We'll also continue to strive for improved data transparency across the spectrum. And, and as Seth mentioned, there's a lot of data gaps here. Um, one of the ways that we could really use um, your help and other, you know, other folks that aren't on here today um, would be to ground truth some of the data that we're at, we are able to access and, and the data gaps that are out there. Uh, we have a, a mobile app fittingly called Frack Tracker. Um, it allows users to see active oil and gas wells near them on a national map. Um, and we haven't limited it just to fracking wells or just to unconventional wells because the distinction, the line between those is um, very fuzzy. And you know, as Seth was saying about some of the oil wells being fracked, but they wouldn't necessarily be considered fracking wells in some cases. Um, we just kept all of the active oil and gas wells on this map. We also have um, on the map um, national pi pipelines, and we've added the Falcon as well as another pipeline under construction in Pennsylvania. The app also allows you to submit reports and photos about those activities, um, kind of like if you were to envision Instagram for oil and gas. Um, so those are some great opportunities, and I think now we're going to open it up to Q&A, but thank you again for having me today. Great. Thank you, Sam and Seth. Um, we have uh, questions, a couple of questions. If you have not had a chance to type in your question, um, if you can go to the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A section. Please type in any questions that you have for the speakers. 
Um, we have one question for Dr. Shankoff, uh, who asked that, um, Dr. Shankoff noted that it would be hard to regulate oil field produced water for water reuse since there are so many different sources. Are there any regulatory levels in general, for example, for discharge into the environment? Are there any, so if I understood the question correctly, um, it's asking, are there current regu regulatory mechanisms for discharge of oil field wastewater to the environment? Is that correct? Yes, I think so. Um, yeah, so um, yes, there are. Um, but they're predominantly on a case-by-case -case basis as determined by, um, at least in the state of California, by um, whatever regional water board uh, is issuing the discharge permit. So, um, for example, the, the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board uh, issues permits to each operator who discharges uh, their produced water to land, uh, either to irrigation or to percolation pits, um, et cetera. Um, and in that discharge permit, there are requirements for monitoring. Now, um, uh, what that means, uh, or what that has meant, you know, in the very recent past is uh, that the that any water quality monitoring um, would happen uh, relatively infrequently and only on the naturally occurring uh, compounds that you would expect to come up from an oil or gas reservoir um, and not uh, the chemical additives. Now that has recently changed somewhat. Now they require monitoring for chemical additives. Um, but what is occurring is uh, the oil and gas operators are writing down names of chemical additives, but not their unique chemical IDs. Um, so there will be a listing for say corrosion inhibitor number 6251. Um, nobody knows what that is. Um, nobody knows the, the toxicity, uh, the chronic toxicity, the mutagenicity, uh, what the daughter products of that would be, what the synergistic byproducts of um, that compound mixing with others uh, under uh, uh, periods of high heat and pressure in an oil field, um, and then being exposed to air upon, upon production. Um, uh, and uh, the reporting for all the chemical additives so far has been non-detect, non-detect, non-detect. However, there is no disclosure of what type of monitoring is being applied to that water to look for oftentimes pretty weird chemicals. Um, there's also not a pretty, there's, there's also not a, not a clear indication of um, what the limit of detection used is. So, um, you know, if there is a limit of detection for a compound that's health relevant, we don't know if they're below that or above it, um, et cetera. So um, I would say there's a lot of work to be done, um, but at the, to answer the question very shortly and directly, yes, there are some rules. Um, there's a follow-up question. Are the unknown chemicals, and I think, you know, you would classify them as trade secrets. They're, they're known to the companies, but not disclosed. Is that correct? And then how, what would need to be, you know, taken at a regulatory level to get them to disclose these chemicals? Great question. Um, uh, so uh, the answer is surprisingly not always do operators know uh, what the chemicals are. Um, there was a bill that was recently passed in California called Assembly Bill 1328, uh, which gives uh, water boards the authority to ask not only the operator, but the chemical suppliers um, to that operator what chemicals are being used in oil fields that are discharging to land. So including irrigation, percolation pits, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, what was, we just got the first pulse of that data because um, the bill just went, just, just went into effect recently. 
um, what we found was that there were more chemicals disclosed than what I presented to you that I've that we've already crunched. Um, uh, and uh, part of the reason for that, possibly, um, although this has not been confirmed, is that the chemical suppliers, so the Schlumbergers, the Halliburtons, um, and others, uh, actually knew more than the operators knew about what they were injecting. Um, so. Yeah, so the, the answer is complicated. <laughs> the answer is complicated. Yes. Um, Sam, I had a question for you. You mentioned that there was a, a case um, where luxury housing was in the path of the pipeline. Um, how about uh, low income communities or communities of color? Um, could you talk a little bit about the impact of your work on those communities and are they able to use the data that you've provided to to speak up and um, and to make changes? Absolutely. So the the area surrounding the cracker, the proposed plant, um, that that's a significant area of concern. Um, they've they've had a lot of other industrial activity in that region, and they they're using our data to um, work with communities to identify what concerns they have about this process. Not just the pipeline, but the the cracker facility itself. Um, uh, in terms of the, the proximity to residences, um, people would individually sign easements if they own property. So it's a little different in those cases because they've agreed to allow the pipeline through. They might not have necessarily known the large scale you know, implications of it, but they, they permitted that activity. So that's a little different in terms of the environmental justice. But overall, the, the region has a lot of environmental justice areas that um, Will will certainly be impacted not just by the pipeline but by the facility itself, and the I guess the surrounding infrastructure that goes into that as well. Okay, great. We have another question for Seth, um, Dr. Shankoff. If chemicals used in oil and gas production were disclosed, would it be possible to filter or treat the water well enough to make it safe for use on agriculture for consumption? Um, I, uh, if another question to go along with that is, uh, are, is there any research to evaluate whether or not the fruits or vegetables or other agriculture products, um, is there any evidence that the chemicals migrate to the actual, um, food products? Yeah, uh, also two great questions. Um, so I'll take the first one. I'll take them each individually. So because um, they actually and they will feed into each other. So um, the first question, if we did have excellent chemical disclosure, could we filter those chemicals out? Uh, the answer is maybe. Um, so so basically, if we had full chemical disclosure, we would be in a good position to be able to evaluate the effectiveness of treatment um, of, of those chemicals that went into oil and gas wells. The complication, however, well, there's a few complications. One is in order to test something post-treatment, test a water uh, uh, flow, you know, after it's gone through a, a treatment train, you need to know how to test for it. Right and uh, analytical techniques have not necessarily been developed to uh, be able to detect those compounds um, at levels where they might be of health relevance. Um, the second complication is individual compounds go into the oil and gas recipe, but as anyone who knows who mixes a bunch of stuff together into a bowl and then puts it into the oven, um, what you get is not necessarily, is more than the sum of its products. So, um, so basically, uh, and there's been some, some pretty detailed research on, on a few of the compounds. Um, so glutaraldehyde, for example, is a um, one of the most prolifically used biocides um, for controlling bacteria in the subsurface to prevent fouling of wells. Um, glutaraldehyde is toxic in its own right, but what it actually breaks down to, the daughter products of glutaraldehyde are actually more toxic 
um, uh, than what glutaraldehyde is when it goes in. Um, so we know a lot about glutaraldehyde, but there are perhaps thousands of other compounds that are being used across the oil and gas industry across the United States um, where we don't have that kind of information yet. Um, so it would be difficult um, to, to get to a point where we would fully understand um, whether our treatment trains are effective at bringing uh, this water uh, into, into compliance um, uh, with respect to you know, health risks. Um, the second question, um, research to evaluate produce. There, there is some limited uh, testing of various um, pieces of produce in uh, the Coelho Water District in California right now. Um, uh, the oil industry and the water district are, um, have been uh, asked to pay for that to not put a drain on taxpayer money, which I think is probably a, a, good, a good thing because um, it's very expensive to do this. The, the, um, the issue is that it's, if you think that testing water for um, uh, routine compounds such as heavy metals and, um, uh, and, and other constituents, if you think it's hard to do that in water, try doing that in plants. Um, I went to a cocktail bar in Oakland uh, a few weeks ago and ordered a cocktail with a, with a, a citrus twist and they twisted the citrus put a lighter under it and lit it on fire. So there's, there's a lot of volatile compounds already naturally occurring in citrus, um, for example, which is one of the key uh, crops uh, in, in these water districts. Um, so trying to parse it apart um, from uh, volatile organics or others that, that may be in, in oil field produced water is, is very difficult. Um, so, uh, you know, I, so far there has not been, um, big hits in terms of problems identified. Um, but that said, there have only been, there's only been monitoring of produce for a very limited set of constituents, almost none of which include these additives or their associated daughter products or synergistic byproducts. Okay. I have one last Perhaps you can answer this short question, um, Seth. For oil, per, oil field produced water, is norm ten norm an issue? Um, naturally occurring or technology technologically enhanced naturally occurring radioactive materials? Uh, yes, uh, it is a concern, um, but it the the amount of concern. Um, that is reasonable is uh, greatly determined by the, the geology and in particular the petroleum geology of individual places. So, um, uh, you know, in the Northeast, uh, in Pennsylvania, you know, especially with development of shale, the produced water there comes up pretty hot. Um, there's a lot of radium-226 um, in the San Joaquin Valley of California, um, depending on where you are, it comes up a little less hot, um, but you're not, you're going to find some radium, but you're going to also find uh, uranium. Um, so, um, yes, it is a concern. Um, and yes, it is greatly determined by geographic and geological factors. Okay, great. Um, I think that's, we're already over time, so I'll give it back over to you, Maria. Great. Thank you, Karen. We are approaching the end of today's webinar. The video recording will be available on the CHE website soon, and tomorrow you will receive an email containing a link to the video. CHE's next call from the CHE Alaska Partnership will take place Wednesday, June 13th, and is titled Disproportionate Exposures to Toxics, a conversation with environmental justice reporter Brian Binkowski. CHE's final webinar from today's series, 20 Pioneers Under 40 in Environmental Public Health, will take place Thursday, June 28th, and is titled Pesticide Exposure in Vulnerable Populations, New Horizons for Evaluating Sources and Health Outcomes. To learn more and RSVP, please visit our website at healthandenvironment.org. 
If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events and more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars, bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank our speakers once more for taking the time to present today and Karen for her excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great day.